Uh, good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Institute for International and uh, European Affairs. Um, I might draw your attention to the escape route. I'm also <coughs> asked to, oh yes, that's a very important thing, lest embarrassment is caused, um, to uh, silence your phone, please. Um, you are encouraged, uh, those of you who in, indulge in such practices, you're encouraged to tweet during the event. The handle is at IIEA. Um, the presentation will be on the record and the discussion afterwards, if there is such, um, would be under Europe House or Chatham House rules, but they are, I think, very closely related, if not uh, identical. Um, today's uh, uh, meeting is, is one in a series which uh, has been sponsored by the ESB, and we are very pleased to welcome Christian Ruby to talk to us, um, a, a, an expert with an interesting ba uh, background, master's degree in history and international development, um, uh, experience as a journalist, uh, uh, I think for seven years working as a public uh, servant in uh, Danish uh, government, the ministries of the environment and of climate and energy, and also experience in the cabinet of uh, Connie Hedegaard in, in uh, Brussels in the European Commission. But now um, he is with Euroelectric um, after a period with, I think, Wind Europe. Yeah. Um, in, Europe uh, in Euroelectric, he, he served as a chief policy officer and was in charge of the development and implementation of the political um, uh, st strategy. Um, if I might ask um, Paddy Hayes, Managing Director of ESB Networks, to introduce uh, the context of this meeting, please, Paddy. Thank you very much, Owen, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, as Owen said, uh, ESB has uh, long been associated with uh, the IIEA in terms of uh, a series of energy lectures uh, going back uh, going back almost uh, 10 years and in fact we have a longer association in f even to that with uh, with your electric um, but we're delighted to be associated with this partnership um, the theme for this year is the electric lifestyle uh, we think it's particularly relevant to the work that we in ESB are trying to do and in fact the work that I know a number of people in the room are trying to do uh, in terms of leading the transition the transition to a low carbon future and a, a secure and affordable low carbon future. We always appreciate the quality of the speakers that, uh, that the IIEA invite and the quality of thinking and the perspective that this brings to the energy debates. And, uh, and Christian Ruby is a, is a case in point. Christian has shown himself over the last uh, two years, I'm sure before, but the last two years in your electric, he's shown himself to be a real leader and thinker. Uh, he's succeeded in aligning the European electricity industry around a shared vision for a neutral, uh, carbon neutral energy mix. And when you think about the diverse uh, interests and uh, national interests and economic constraints around, uh, around Europe, that's no mean feat at all. Uh, at ESB, uh, we share the belief, we share the belief that this is about generating, connecting uh, more renewable and low carbon sources of electricity. And we have the belief that it's about using that clean electricity then particularly to drive heating and to drive transport. So the electric heating and electric transport become, become the norm rather than the exception. So I'm delighted that Christian's here with us uh, to share some of his thoughts, his perspectives, and his expertise while discussing the, uh, the role of electricity in the decarbonisation of Europe. So thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Thank you. Good afternoon, and um, thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Um, I really like this, uh, the, the title of these lectures, Electric Lifestyle. It, it sounds very nice, and, and it's, it really uh, cuts to the point of, of what a low-carbon lifestyle is going to be about. It's going to be an electric lifestyle. I'll show you a little bit of, uh, let's say, the, the evidence behind this. Maybe just a few words on, on, uh, on what was already mentioned uh, with regard to the process in your electric. I came from the wind industry, and um, and 
In 2017, I took over uh, at Your Electric, and what we did was basically to, to have a look and, and say, uh, let's try to get the leaders together and find out what's the direction we want to take and what's our value uh, proposition for society. And, um, and that resulted in a, in a very uh, crisp, I find, document uh, of two pages where we set out our contribution, which is essentially to accelerate the energy transition and to provide clean electricity as a transformation tool for other sectors that want to decarbonize. Uh, that's the, uh, let's say, the commitment of, of the entire industry in Europe, even the ones that have a very different starting point than the one we have here in Ireland and, and the one we have in my home country, which is Denmark. Um, so that's, that's a little bit um, the context for this. Uh, what we did was basically to set out and, and try to um, uh, do some analysis on the basis of this uh, uh, vision and say, can this be done? How can this be done? And, um, and, and what needs to happen in the different sectors as a consequence? Um, this beautiful poetic title, I uh, won't spend much time on this, but um, essentially what this study is about is to try to um, fix this problem. This is, in, in essence, uh, the problem of, of, uh, of Europe, European uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, up in the white space on the right, you have the stuff we don't look at. That's the burping cows. It's the process emissions from industries that don't have a lot to do with the way we produce uh, energy and consume energy in society. The rest, the three quarters, the blue stuff on the left-hand side, that's where we produce energy. That's where we use energy across society. That's our sector. It's the energy sector. It's the transport sector. It's the building sector. And it's the industry sectors that uh, basically account for around three quarters of uh, the emissions that, that we have and uh, that constitute the, the climate challenge we're, uh, we have uh, ahead of us. Um, we're doing this in the context of, uh, of some very ambitious policies that are going on at EU level. Uh, currently, the European Commission is discussing the so-called long-term climate and energy strategy that aims at, well, at least from what we hear, uh, to, to create a, a net zero carbon society by 2050. And net zero carbon means that there are no net emissions and that's very ambitious. I'm going to show you just how ambitious that is. We share that vision. Um, we also... Uh, say politely that is very ambitious and we need to be uh, aligned about the fact that if we want to go there, that requires some significant shifts for consumers, for companies, and for the, uh, for the society in general. What we did in this uh, analysis is basically to uh, draw up three different scenarios of how we could deliver on the Paris Agreement. Um, Today we've uh, decarbonized or we've reduced emissions by 22% compared to 1990 levels. Um, already in Europe. The first scenario is what European politicians have already promised to do uh, as part of the Paris Agreement. The second scenario is a scenario where we say, let's assume that they want to do more um, and ramp up ambitious as, uh, as part of a uh, global consensus to do so. The third scenario is going all the way to a net zero carbon society. We've modeled this as 95% because um, essentially if you reduce emissions in the energy using sectors by 95%, you could compensate for the rest by reforestation measures or flexibility measures. But we're, as I'll show you in a second, with that last scenario, we're in, in very, very new territory. So, um, so if we just start by moving over to that right-hand side, um, we're, we're already uh, doing quite a, quite a bit. Electric lifestyle, it's a good, um, it's a good term to, to sort of focus on, on what needs to happen if, if, we, if we move there, because consumer behavior is gonna be a very essential part of this. We just had a lunch discussion about the way we transport ourselves in society. How do we get from A to B? Uh, for sure, that's gonna change. That's gonna change in the next decade as a consequence of legislation that's already being proposed but it, it needs to change much more radically if we want to move to a net zero carbon society. Uh, the ambition level uh, in the different scenarios is underpinned by different types of regulation. Do we go for one measure to, to basically reduce carbon emissions across society or do we go for a, a number of, of different interrelated measures? And of course, uh, technology development is also a key part in this. What we've tried to do here in this study is, is say, 
let's not count the moonshots. Let's not assume that something crazy happens and, and that we, all of a sudden we can, we can do something that we've never dreamed of. We try to look at the current technologies and say, let's speed them up. Um, let's see what happens if we want to go to those very ambitious levels of decarbonization. What needs to happen in terms of technology deployment, uh, technology maturation in renewables, in electric cars, in heating, in industry, and so forth. So, how did we analyze this? It's said that economists and artists have one thing in common. They tend to fall in love with their models. Um, I was always more of the artist kind, uh, and uh, this, this kind of model for me is, is a little bit square. It is quite a good model, um, but what we wanted to make sure was that uh, we didn't, let's say, fall in love with our own model. So we've done a lot of consultation um, with other industries, with civil society, in order to get this not as a, let's say, uh, the final answer, but rather as a um, iterative discussion on how, on how this needs to be done. Essentially, the model is composed of three dimensions. Uh, on top, you have uh, eight regions that we've studied. For, for one reason or the other, they make sense to look at together. You have the Iberian Peninsula. It's interconnected, but it's isolated from the, from, from the rest of Europe. You have Poland, which is a special case altogether. You have the Nordics, and so on and so forth. On the vertical uh, dimension, uh, we have the sectors, as I described before, and at, at the bottom we have the different energy sources that power our society. And how do these three uh, dimensions uh, play together? That's what we've uh, looked at um, in, in the scenarios. The ambition is daunting. Let's not beat around the bush. Let's be very clear about that. Since 1990, we've been reducing CO2 emissions by 1% per annum. If we want to move to 2050 uh, and 80% reductions by 2050, we need to speed up and go for 4% per annum. Moving to 90% requires 6% per annum, and moving to 95% is 8% per annum. It seems counterintuitive the first time you see those numbers. That, that doesn't make sense uh, arithmetically. It makes sense. It, 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 it's basically the case. So, so we, shouldn't, we shouldn't kid ourselves. This is ambitious, no matter how you turn and toss it. It's daunting, but it's also doable. And I think that's the good and positive message that we want to insist to have as an industry. It is really doable. It's doable with a combination of energy efficiency measures and electrification measures. On the left-hand side, you see how we need to uh, reduce total final energy consumption across society um, from 0 0.6 to 1.3 per annum year in year growth. On the other hand side, uh, you see uh, basically how we need to drive direct electrification of the other sectors um, at ranges ranging from 1% to 1.5% per annum. That means we're talking about significant electrification significant build out of the power sector if this needs to happen. But it's doable. It requires us to work together and it requires us to have a very, very clear uh, mandate to build out the power sector and to connect the, uh, the rest of the economy around the power sector. This is a deep dive on, on the net zero emissions um, uh, scenario. The blue line is uh, the, the emission reductions. The white stuff on top, that's direct total energy savings, so we need to use less energy across society if this needs to happen. The dark stuff is the emitting fuels. That's on a steady decline. There's going to be just a little bit left. We still want to fly somewhere in 2050, and we might not have all electric planes for the long haul. We still want to carry goods places where we cannot perhaps get um, uh, electric transport for it when we talk about maritime transport. At the bottom, you see the build-out and, and the increased consumption of electricity moving to 60% of the total final energy consumption, up from around 20% today. So a very significant shift. That doesn't mean necessarily that it triples. It just means that it takes a larger share. And in the middle, you have the rest. Uh, the green stuff on top is um, other carbon-free sources, direct solar, geothermal, and so on and so forth. The light green stuff is what we call power to X, or indirect electrification. 
So the creation of liquid fuels or gases based on power. So you take um, clean electricity and you create gas out of it through a process of electrolysis, for example. That way you have a clean fuel in a gaseous form. That's also part of the solution. Otherwise, we're going to have trouble basically powering a number of the sectors that are difficult to decarbonize today. In this debate on, on climate action and um, decarbonization, we've, all, all, we, we've often heard that energy efficiency is a bad idea, at least from the industry. That's not what we're saying here. That's the opposite of what we're saying here. What we think is that essentially it doesn't work without. You need massive energy savings to make this happen. The good news is that electrification is by implication also an efficiency strategy. When you move from an ICE car to an electric car, there's an immediate energy saving inherent in that, just because the motor is much better. When you go from gas heating of a house to a heat pump, you immediately save a lot of energy because it's a much more efficient technology. When you use uh, industrial heat pumps, it's the same story. So you have very, very significant energy savings coming just from the fact that we electrify. Across the scenarios, we find that uh, the savings gained from electrification constitute around a third, regardless of whether we look at 80%, 90 or 95%. And that's a very good piece of news. So let's look at this lifestyle. Let's look at just how significant this is if we want to move there. Transport sector is, um, is a challenge because there's not much we can do it about planes, at least not for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, we have some very interesting plans coming out of Norway, for example, to electrify short-haul planes, uh, all short-haul uh, destinations. They want to electrify that. Maybe doable, um, and probably it's the right way to go. The long haul, we don't see a solution for that based on electricity today. So there are other decarbonization options in play for that, and probably there's still going to be emissions from airplanes uh, also for some time in the future. Trucks. Same story. We can do some of the trucks. We can go electric with some of the trucks. The long haul looks very difficult today. That will require other energy carriers. The buses, we can go quite far. Essentially, the message arising from this is that we, where we really need to drive the change, literally speaking, is with passenger cars and vans. To reach the high levels, we need to have 100% of new sales coming uh, from electric cars in, by 2050 uh, in, the, in the highest scenarios. And the share of the fleet also needs to be very close to 100%, 96%. So a full shift to electric cars as a necessity to move towards uh, the full decarbonization. What we don't see in these numbers, because they're percentages, is that the absolute amount of cars is significantly reduced between the first, uh, the, the second scenario, is there a, between this scenario and this scenario, this scenario has half the amount of cars as this one. That's the only way you can get to those extreme levels of decarbonization. That means we need to move towards much more shared modes of transport. It needs, means we need to move to um, much more interconnected uh, modes of transport uh, in order for this to happen. So you can see it is really a daunting ambition. Um, it's doable if everybody wants to do it, but it's, it really comes with a lot of implications for our lifestyle. What we often hear is that, um, well, they're more expensive, these, these cars. Um, well, yeah, probably today, but in five years' time, in three years' time, just around the beginning of the 2020s, it's going to be more uh, expensive to have a combustion engine car seen over the lifetime of the car uh, compared to an electric car. So the total cost of ownership, as we call it, shifts from, uh, from uh, let's say, being in favor of ICE cars today to electric cars in just two, three, two, two to three years' time. Depends on who you ask. If you ask Renault-Nissan, it's 2021. If it's McKinsey, it's more 2025. But it's going to happen within a, a few years' time. So why won't people just switch immediately um, as soon as that car is, is cheaper? Well, people are not that rational. 
There's a lot of things that come into that equation, the range anxiety, uh, the ability to charge, um, the phase out of the other cars, uh, the scrapping premium, the incentives to do this stuff. All these things play into the equation of how fast this is gonna happen. So again, consumers need to be involved, they need to be engaged and make those choices. Regulators need to send the right signals and we need basically to agree that this is what, what we want to do and have a very, very strong commitment to make this happen at the speed we need. Electrification of residential heating is another point, and there's a lot happening already. I mean, it's, I don't know about you guys, but um, cooking with gas, that's, that's long gone for me. Um, I used to like it, but um, I don't miss it today. Uh, so that's electrified in many houses today. Um, many places, they don't roll out the gas infrastructure anymore for, for, um, for the residential uh, uh, piece. And um, now the next step is essentially to get the heating tr transitioned to, to electricity uh, and also to get the, the water heating uh, transitioned. I went and saw a place in France where they um, built a new house uh, and the new houses are so insulated that you only essentially need to heat the water and heat your food the rest, basically, the, the, house, the house takes care of. There's a very, very limited need for heating if you insulate the house right. That's where the energy savings and the energy efficiency comes in. That's another dimension of this. We need very well insulated houses in order to transition to electrical heating. When you have that, you can also basically heat your house with electricity. A quick glance on the industrial sectors. Uh, this is a very big challenge because it ranges from chemicals to iron uh, to other industries. These are essentially completely different challenges uh, and some of them can be electrified. Some of them will need to rely on other types of decarbonization strategies using biofuels, using hydrogen, using CCS. Um, otherwise, this is not going to uh, work. and. Uh, and therefore we say this is really, let's say, uh, a, a palette of different options that is needed to decarbonize the industry. What we do see, however, is that electricity continues to surprise with its ability to provide solutions. Right now, our vice president from Vattenfall is um, investing in a big uh, carbon-free steel plant based on hydrogen. They take carbon-free electricity, either from nuclear or from hydropower, they transform it into hydrogen uh, through an electrolysis process, and they have created a completely new steel, uh, let's say, production, um, steel production process um, based on this, uh, which allows them to produce carbon-free steel. Same thing is happening in Austria, and, um, and we're beginning to see that many industries take a real interest in trying to reinvent their industrial processes. Same goes for uh, um, chemicals, petrochemicals. Um, when we presented these numbers to them, they said, you're not ambitious enough on our behalf. We can do more and we, can, we just need a lot of electricity from you guys. So there's a fundamental shift in the mindset happening in, in, in parts of the industrial sectors. And I think over the next 10 years, we're gonna see some very interesting examples of these uh, industrial processes being revamped, uh, being rethought in, uh, in new ways. So overall, the picture is, as I said, the low carbon lifestyle or the no carbon lifestyle is an electrical lifestyle. There's an unbreakable link between decarbonization and electrification. The deeper you want to go, the more electricity you need and the more you need to depend on electricity. 80% brings us in the range of 40% of total final energy consumption coming from electricity. 90% brings us up to around 50 and 95% brings us to 60% of all societal energy coming from electricity. There's no way really around this, and this is uncontroversial, by the way. Um, we have benchmarked this across a number of different studies, um, and nobody is really disputing these figures with us. People that know the fundamental physics of this, the, the fundamentals of, of this decarbonization process, they agree this can't be done in many other ways. Maybe you can invest like crazy in one other technology, uh, in hydrogen, for example, and, and then you can skew these numbers, but the basic physics of this is that direct electrification is a better way of using the energy 
once you, you go through the conversion losses of bringing electricity into the form of gas, you're losing energy on the way, and we need all the energy we have uh, in order to get there. That's also the inherent message here. So the short message is that um, in your electric, we're electric about this, and that is because the future is electric. Thank you. Okay.